today on Inside the Issues, Tom Burns on Global Economic Cooperation. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, your host, the Balsillie School's uh, CG Chair of Global Security and also Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week we talk to a noted expert on an important area of global governance. And uh, this week I'm pleased to welcome to the studio Tom Burns, the Executive Director of the Center for International Governance Innovation here in Waterloo, Ontario. Tom has a long distinguished career, both in the Canadian government and in the International Monetary Fund. So he has both a practitioner's and an analyst's perspective on global economic cooperation. And welcome, Tom. Thank you, David. So let's talk a bit about uh, the recent financial crisis, which of course is on everyone's mind. Uh, I think a lot of us don't frankly quite understand why that happened. It seemed to catch everyone off guard. Uh, not everyone, I should say. There are a small number of people who successfully predicted that we would be encountering heavy weather. But it's the second serious financial crisis in just over 10 years. Uh, very, very important development. Uh, looking back now, as we seem to be coming out of the crisis and beginning to recover from it, what are people saying about its causes? And what are people saying about what we did wrong to, to put ourselves in a position to experience that kind of downturn this time? Well, I think there's a huge debate uh, on that question. And frankly, I think for the next 30, 40 years, we're going to find many students writing many theses on why exactly it happened. Uh, I mean, it's clear that, that there was a, a breakdown in the U.S. financial system, which then spread globally, uh, affecting not just the financial world, but then the real economy as, as credit dried up. Uh, but, but some analysts will point, for example, to Canada, to Australia, which in relative terms, uh, their financial systems did not break down. And so it raises the question, was it really the regulatory regime itself, or it, it, was, it, was it the management? of the regulatory regime? Was it a lapse in, 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 in implementation? So uh, you can have that debate, but, but, but what is clear, uh, there are, are you know, elements that, that allowed leverage of US and UK financial institutions to grow far bigger than the system was able to, to uh, withstand when it received a shock as, as it did with, with, a, with a, uh, a credit crunch in one particular area. And so that's, you know, the response has been to patch the whole waltz, and, and that's important and some progress has been made. Uh, in terms of a more fundamental understanding of what happened, a lot of work in trying to understand that, develop policy responses to that is, is really just, just starting and it is going to be, as I say, the uh, uh, on the agenda of, of students, professors, think tanks, policy makers for, for some time to come. And is the common wisdom that this was an American problem that through contagion just so happened to sideswipe the global economy? Or was this a structural problem with the global economy that just happened to express itself early and particularly acutely in the United States? I think my view is that, that it was a global financial system problem that, that, that first broke out in, in the United States. Uh, there was a number of commentators, particularly a number of European commentators at the start of the crisis said, see, this is a U.S. problem. Uh, but very quickly what, what uh, became clear was, was uh, there were some very deep-rooted problems in the Europe financial system that had nothing to do with, uh, with what was going on in the United States. The overextension of the banks in in Iceland, in Ireland, uh, a weakness in some of the peripheral countries that, that um, when things were going smoothly did not appear to be as important as they really were. When, when problems arose in the United States and began to spread out, then these other problems became clear. So it, it was a global problem. It wasn't just a U.S. problem. Mm -hmm. And how does it compare to the East Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s? That was essentially a problem with too much capital moving too quickly in and out of vulnerable economies, as I understand it. It, it was. I mean, the, the East Asian crisis it wasn't as big. It didn't involve 
the global economy to the extent that this crisis did. But some of the, and, and, and it, the reasons differed as between countries. In, in uh, Thailand, it, it was more of a, of a fiscal problem. In Indonesia, it was problem on corporate balance sheets. Uh, one of the lessons that, that came out of the Asian crisis, but, but that wasn't obviously uh, learned sufficiently, was, was that you, you can't just look at a government's uh, fiscal accounts, but you need to look at the overall balance sheets of, of an economy. What, what's the overall borrowing? What, what are companies doing? And, and there were a number of, of studies done right after the, the financial crisis in Asia that said we need to understand better the links between the financial world, the corporate world, uh, how they interact uh, so that we better understand uh, what's happening. And the reality is we didn't do that. And so once again, coming out of this crisis, and if you look at what the G20 said and the IMF has said uh, over the last year, which is we're going to do a much better job understanding links between the financial world, the real economy, uh, and what that means, and, 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 and spillovers going forward. But it still is work to be done as opposed to we now understand it. Mm. Now, the public perception is that there were villains involved, and human nature likes to see villains where there are problems. And, of course, we pointed the finger at Goldman Sachs and at Lehman's and sort of outrageous corporate compensation and, uh, and so forth. How much of that criticism is fair and how much of that is sort of mistaking a symptom for a cause? I mean, some of the criticism is fair. I mean clearly there were people like the Matovs and, and others who had, had were engaging in criminal activity. Uh, some of the other financial institutions what they were doing, whether you agree with it or not, was, was legal. So they were not breaking the laws. Whether it was morally responsible uh, is another question. You, c you can, can uh, debate it. But I think the more fundamental point is, is that at the end of the day, the financial system is there to be an inter intermediary. Uh, it's there to support the real economy, which is what produces goods, creates jobs, allows people to have a good life, and it became, you know, a world unto it itself, where, where financial products uh, were sliced, diced, legally in many ways, but but in ways which, frankly, the people running these businesses didn't fully understand. The top management, their boards didn't understand, the regulators did not understand, and 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 so, that's part of what we're going through now is trying to say how do we, we have a financial system that, that better supports the real economy, that does not lead to this excessive leveraging and, and therefore excessive risks, uh, and probably it provides compensation that is uh, more in line with, with, with uh, uh, what takes place in the rest of the economy and back where the financial sector was if you look back 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, let's come back in a moment and talk about some of the fixes. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Tom, uh, people like heroes as well as villains, and in the aftermath of the crisis, uh, there were some people who at least tried to don the mantle of hero. There was Gordon Brown in Britain who tried to mobilize an international response. Um, President of the United States, either a hero or a villain, depending, I think, on your ideological perspective. And our own Prime Minister, uh, Stephen Harper. Now, they, they weren't all attempting to do the same thing. And they identified different problems in need of different kinds of fixes. Uh, what's your take on the immediate response to the crisis? And whether, whether the international response that Gordon Brown was trying to mobilize was, was appropriate, or whether the sort of domestic uh, assertion of sovereign authority to regulate which was the American primary response was appropriate, or the it ain't broke, we don't have to fix it attitude of our own prime minister was appropriate. What's your take on those various views? I think most commentators would say that, that, that the response through the G20 to the crisis uh, was strong 
was effective, avoided the world falling off an economic precipice. What's interesting it is, is and, it, and it's an important lesson going forward, it is that at a moment of crisis, you can get governments to focus together because you have one agenda, which is everybody's shared agenda uh, in economic terms and political terms. And, and, and they came together, they were able to stabilize the global financial system, get it working again. They were able uh, to implement in, in various ways uh, stimulatory measures in, in respective economies, not to avoid a, an increase in unemployment, that just wasn't possible, but, but to, to soften uh, the, the amount of, of, uh, of job loss. The question, and, and I think, as I said, I think they did a good job. I mean, the question facing the leaders of the G20 now and the world more generally is how do we cooperate going forward? Uh, and that's, that's a real problem because as the crisis receded, uh, the attention span on these issues receded. Some people began to say, well, it really wasn't as bad as, as we thought. Uh, political agendas, because of political electoral cycles, begin to come much more into play uh, as you begin to look at, at medium-term issues. Uh, and so, you know, there is a debate, and some have criticized the G20 of, of not making much progress beyond those initial early steps. I mean, what was done? One, they established a new financial stability board uh, to develop new financial regulation. Uh, that certainly has been a step forward, uh, but there is more that needs to be done. As you know, in, in terms of, of expanding, getting economic growth going again, which is what's going to give us jobs, uh, there's been a debate. Uh, those countries as fortunate as Canada, which has regained all the jobs lost during the recession, uh, have said the emphasis has to be on getting our fiscal books back in order and get eliminating the deficits. Now, countries like the United States, uh, which have an unemployment rate which is not, which in fact is nowhere near coming back to where it was before and which is running uh, much higher than it has in the past. Uh, I mean, Canada traditionally has run one to two percentage points above the U.S. We're below the U.S. I mean, this is, is a huge shift. The U.S. is saying, we need to get the economy going more, we need to get more jobs going. Uh, you see that debate playing out in, in the U.K. as well. Is it, is it deficit reduction in order to lay the groundwork or, or, or is it growth? So uh, these are the big challenges going, going forward. And in Europe, of course, there's a general debt problem. We have Greece, Portugal on the precipice of insolvency, Germany being asked to step in. It's the one generally successful economy in Europe right now. Uh, how much of this is sort of a localized versions of a problem, and how much of this, though, is truly global? There's limited levers, aren't there? I mean, at the international level, li limited levers for making sure that countries keep their fiscal books in order and that they, they don't run excessive debts. And the market doesn't readily punish people who run up too much in the way of debt, doesn't seem. So how do you actually enforce a kind of discipline when people are unwilling to do it themselves for, as you mentioned, short-term political reasons? Well, I mean, markets do punish eventually. As, 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 uh, I mean, if one thinks of Canada back in the 90s, the, our, the interest rates we were having to pay in government debt were running up. and, and the government was very concerned that if something was not done, we would have to call in the IMF. And we went through a very painful period in Canada to get our, our, our debt down. We ran a surplus for a number of years, and <clears throat> that's partly why we, we've done, in relative terms, so much better during this crisis. Uh, what's interesting with the European countries, they in fact do have rules uh, within the European Union that says, your, your deficit can't run more than 3% uh, of your, 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 your GDP. Your overall debt level should not be above 
Uh, what we saw, however, is that, is that uh, those were breached. Uh, they were breached also by big countries such as France and Germany who, when they were running up against those limits, said, well, no, we need to introduce some flexibility in them. Right. Uh, and so the question you raised, I mean, there are a few levers. Uh, it's true, at the end of the day, the, the levers exist when a country has no other choice. Uh, but the levers to, to force a country to do the right things, when things appear to be going relatively well, uh, are non-existent. So that's one of the big policy challenges we have going forward. How do we, how do we get countries individually, but also collectively, to understand the risks to their own economy, but given our independencies, the risks to the rest of the world. Uh, if the U.S. financial system breaks down, it's not just their system, it's our system. So you know, how do we better understand this? Getting people to row not only in sync, but in the same direction. That's right. <laughs> we'll be right back with Tom Burns. You're watching or listening to CG's Inside the Issues online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Tom, you were talking about Europe having a relatively integrated financial system. Uh, unprecedented historically, you don't see examples of sovereign countries getting together and agreeing on uh, pooling a bunch of decision-making authorities in addition to sharing currency. That's unusual. Uh, there's been talk since the introduction of the euro of the possibility that it might supplant the U.S. dollar as the, the dominant global currency. And the talk was re-energized, of course, as a result of the global economic crisis. Uh, what's the current thinking about the likelihood that the dollar will remain the central currency of the international economy? I think most experts would say that, that the U.S. dollar is going to remain the primary reserve currency for the foreseeable future. Having said that, if you look at the euro, for instance, which is a relatively new currency, it, it, it's only been around for, uh, uh, for what? 19 years, I think. Yeah, well, not even, I mean, 19 years. But, but it now, about a third of the world reserves are now held in the euro. Uh, the United States, the reserves held in U.S. dollars is down from you know, 80% down to, to about 60, 65%, I think it's in that range. Uh, so that you're already seeing some diversification. Now, at the end of the day, uh, this is the choice of individual countries. It, it's a question of their assessment of risk. Uh, if they have reserves, what do they want to hold them in? Do they want to hold them in their own currency? Do they want to hold them in, in U.S. dollars? Do they want to hold them in euro? There is some diversification taking place. Some have said, you know, we need either more currencies or, or we need a basket. And some have talked about the SDR, the special drawing right, which is a uh, is, is, exists on paper as part of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, very few people understand what it is. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an artificial currency, one could say, of the IMF, in which some reserves are held, but it's not a real currency. The SDR could, over time, uh, develop in, into an instrument which would allow uh, countries to invest in essentially what would be a, a, a pool, a basket of currencies. But in order to do that, you'd have to turn it into an instrument that was actually traded, that was used for settling uh, financial transactions between countries. Uh, you would need to see bonds issued in, in SDRs. I mean, that, that process, even if there were a decision to go ahead with that, would, would be a 15, 20, 25 year uh, process. So, And it's not actually backstopped by a real economy anyway, right? It's at the end of the day, that's right. And so, as I said earlier, it's a question of risk and it's a question of what countries would do. The U.S. dollar has been the principal reserve because people, countries, have faith that the United States is, is 
the least risky of all of the assets you could hold, and that the United States, given it, its enormous economic power, has the ability at the end of the day to deliver on its obligations and to protect the value of, of its currency. Whether people would ever reach the point where they would have that confidence in an international organization that has no taxing power, that, that they're going to preserve the ability of that, I, I, I leave to you and, and, uh, uh, and our, our viewers to determine whether that's a realistic possibility. Now the world's second largest economy is China and it has a very unusual currency, a couple of currencies, in fact, right? So is it problematic from a global perspective that China's currency isn't free-floating, well-integrated in wide use as a reserve currency? Uh, is China sitting on the sidelines and, and free-loading off of the liquidity functions of other countries' currencies? Well, it's, it's a huge debate, and there's no doubt that the value of the Chinese currency and, and the fact that it, it doesn't adjust uh, freely uh, has created some economic difficulties for others. Uh, for instance, we know in Canada we've seen this huge appreciation in the Canadian dollar vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. dollar from back in you know, 15 or less years ago when it was 66 U.S cents to the Canadian dollar, whereas, you know, now it's a dollar three uh, recently to buy U.S. to buy Canadian dollar. Part of that, a large part of that is because of economic circumstances, but part of it is also because those countries whose currencies float freely, those adjustments adjust economic activity. Imports become more expensive or less expensive and exports become more or less expensive. And, and Therefore, that affects the economic activity. In the case of China, it doesn't happen so easily. Uh, and so there's been a lot of attention, particularly in the United States, to the value of, of the Chinese RMB. It it's now gets very confusing in part because economists talk about the nominal exchange rate and the real exchange rate. If you look at the nominal, which, which is what we see in currency markets, uh, there's been very little shift. If you look at the real exchange rate, you know, which is a measurement that takes in, into account differential inflation rates, uh, in fact, there has been a substantial appreciation in, in the Chinese RMB. Uh, so I, may, I would make two points. One, the under-evaluation of the RMB. Uh, you know, many economists now would suggest it's probably more in the range of 10 to 15 percent. Two or three years ago, it was more in the range of 25 to 30 percent. So there has been a lot of closure on, on it. Uh, secondly, I think most responsible economists uh, would say that, that the Chinese could not float tomorrow. In order to be able to float, you have to have financial systems uh, in place, the, the deep financial markets, uh, a system that, that can manage that. And the Chinese are moving there, but they're not, they're not there yet today. Right. Still a lot of work to do on the domestic work. regulation front, among other things. That's right. We'll be back once again with Tom Burns. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, Tom, let's talk a bit about CG. You're the executive director of CG, and of course CG's um, mission is to help find creative solutions to global governance problems. So what are some of the key international economic cooperation problems that CG has identified as research priorities, and what kinds of efforts is CG making to contribute to these global debates? I mean, CG, as I hopefully our viewers know, is, is a think tank. And our, what we try and do is, is, is connect policymakers, academic thinking, uh, and, and former practitioners uh, who have been there because it, it, it's a question of how we can, we can get various areas of expertise focusing in practical terms on the same problem at the same time. One of the areas we're, we're looking at right now, and we will have a report coming out shortly, which we're doing together with Chatham House, is on promoting economic cooperation globally and through the G20. Uh, 
I mentioned earlier uh, the whole question of interdependencies. Obviously, given the greater integration of the global economy, what one country does has spillover effects, which can be positive or can be negative uh, on another country. If the U.S. financial system tanks, it's got a negative spillover for all of us. Uh, if, if a country liberalizes its, its trade regime, drops tariffs, that's got a positive spillover on, on us. I mentioned the problem earlier of, of it's easy to get everybody focused when you have a crisis, but as the crisis recedes, how do you get people to focus? And how, if we're going to have countries understanding the impact of their policies on others and, and agreeing on some broad common agenda, then we need to understand just how the interdependencies work. And, and one of the problems right now is, is that we analytically, we don't, we're not capable of that. Uh, the G20 in looking at, at, at the global economy moving forward relies on the work of the IMF. The IMF uses models that basically break the world down into the US, Europe, Asia, uh, and, and some other categories. But it gives you four or five blocks. In, no, in broad sense, knowing where, what that means for the world growth, you can understand. And if you're sitting there as the Prime Minister of Canada, the, the, uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey, or one of these other countries, it's not clear what the impacts of various policies are going to be. And so we need to develop new analytical tools so that we can better understand what the impact of various policies will be uh, that will then allow us to, to hopefully develop co more common policy responses. So that's one area. The whole area of, of, of financial regulation, you know, we put the thumbs in the dike, uh, but Clearly, there, there are some huge problems out there in, in terms of how the new Financial Stability Board is going to operate, uh, what are the rules that should be established for banks that, in fact, are global banks that are too big to fail, is, is the term. Uh, we've made very little progress in terms of how would we have a collective response today. And so uh, if, if we had another crisis, they would still be subject to the same national regulations We've not yet found a better way. Now, at, at Davos recently, you announced a partnership with INET. So this is an even longer term project. Uh, could you tell our viewers a bit about that? I'm sure that will be of interest to many. No, we're very happy to, uh, to have this new partnership. INET, which stands for the Institute for New Economic Thinking, uh, is part of, came out of, out of the crisis. And, uh, and it was a new institute set up, largely funded initially by, by George Soros, uh, which CG and, and other parties are now as well contributing to, CG is as a major partner, but the whole principle was, was not only did we have an economic crisis, we had a crisis in economics. Uh, and that, that clearly the old models, the old paradigms did not work. And so we have to, both from the academic community right up through policymakers really need to, to go back to our roots to rethink. And so uh, with INET, we're doing everything from, from uh, there's a task force looking at the curriculum for the economics uh, discipline in, in, in universities uh, to task forces looking at issues like financial regulation, uh, but getting people to think out, looking in new areas like sustainable economics, uh, even if we correct some of the current problems, the reality is if we're going to address the issues of climate change successfully, if we're going to address the issues of, of social global inequality, uh, then we're going to have to approach a lot of these economic issues with a, a new model, and that's just going to require a lot of new creative thinking. Very full agenda. It is indeed. Well, thanks very much for coming in today and sharing your insights and uh, your views on uh, how CG can contribute. And Thank to you. our viewers, please join us again next week. Uh, this is Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us on cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter.